Welcome to the fourth and final part of our lecture on section 3.7 applications of number theory. In this part we'll be looking at how large number arithmetic can be performed on a digital computer. Before we begin with the application however let's take a quick review of the Chinese remainder theorem. The Chinese remainder theorem gives us information about how to solve systems of linear congruences such as this. If x is congruent to 2 modulo 5, x is congruent to 2 modulo 7, and x is congruent to 6 modulo 7, since the 5, the 7, and the 11 are pairwise relatively prime, we're guaranteed that there has to be at least one solution in the range from 0 up to 384, and it turns out in this case that solution is 72. For the statement of the theorem itself, what we know is that if we've selected n moduli, which are pairwise relatively prime positive integers, and we've constructed a system of linear congruences of this form, then there must be a unique solution modulo m, where m is equal to the product of the moduli, m1 times m2, etc., through mn. Furthermore, any two solutions of this system of linear congruences must be congruent modulo m. Now we get as an immediate corollary to this theorem that every integer in the range from 0 through this product of the moduli, not including that upper limit, uh, has to have a unique representation of remainders when we divide by m1, m2, etc. The reason for that is this. There have to be unique solutions to this system of linear equations. Therefore, any two distinct x's in this range here uh, could not possibly solve the same linear congruence, uh, and therefore the, rem the collection of remainders as an ordered n-tuple must be unique. Let's take a look at that by example. Suppose in this case our moduli were 5, 7, and 11. What the corollary is telling us is that if we look at all integers in the range 0 through 384, it must be the case that if we divide all of those integers by 5, 7, and 11, the ordered collection of remainders has to be unique for each one of those 385 numbers. For instance, if we took a 12 and divided it by 5, we'd get a remainder of 2. If we took the 12 and divided it by 7, we'd get a remainder of 5. And if we divided by 11, we'd get a remainder of 1. That triple, 2, followed by 5, followed by 1, in that order, can't be repeated anywhere in the range from 0 up to 385. Now that would be hard to verify just by computation in this case because we have 385 different numbers. However, we could verify it for a much simpler example. Let's suppose that our two moduli were 2 and 3. But of all of the integers in the range from 0 up to, but not including 6, when we divide by 2 and 3, in that order, we must get a pair of remainders that's unique. Well, let's give it a try and see what happens. When we take 0 and divide by either 2 or 3, both the quotient and the remainders are 0. Well, suppose we took 1. Clearly, the remainders would be 1 in both cases. Now, when we get to 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1, but the remainder is 0. On the other hand, on dividing by 3, the remainder is 2. When we take 3 and divide it by 2, we get remainder 1 and remainder 0 when we divide by 3. 4 gives us remainders of 0 and 1. And finally, 5 gives us remainders of 1 and 2. We have six distinct remainder pairs. And this will always happen. It's guaranteed by the Chinese remainder theorem. Now it turns out that we can exploit this pattern in order to represent large integers with a relatively few digits. Let's get a sense of how that works by looking at another example. Suppose in this case our modulo, moduli were 11, 13, and 17. Now what our corollary is telling us is that every integer in the range from 0 up to 
2,431 has unique triple of remainders, where those remainders are what we get when we divide by 11, 13, and 17. And that's because 11, 13, and 17 are relatively prime. In this case, they are prime numbers, so that's how we know for certain that they are relatively prime. Now, that tells us that the numbers up to 2,431 can all be represented by triples of, of integers, and those triples uh, will be in the range of 0 up, to, up through 10, 0 up through 12, and 0 up through 16. In other words, we're using rather small integers to represent a big one. Well, let's do an example here and see what that looks like. Suppose we took 255 and we wanted to represent that uh, modulo 11, 13, and 17. You all can do this with the calculator that's built into Windows. You select the programmer mode, then we'll take 255 modulo 11, that gives us 2, 255, modulo 13, that gives us 8, 255, modulo 17, is 0. When we compute for 361, we find remainders of 9, 10, and 4. Now there's an interesting pattern that develops here, and in fact it's one that's easily predictable from our earlier theorems on modular arithmetic. If we take these remainders, 9 and 2, and add them, we get 11. 11 modulo 11 is 0. Likewise, 8 plus 10 is 18, modulo 13 is 5 and 0 plus 4, modulo 17, is 4. Now we'll get all the same answers if we were to take the 255 and 361 and first add them and then compute the remainder on division by 11, 13, and 17. The same pattern will be observed with multiplication. If we took the remainders 2 and 9, multiplied them together, and reduced modulo 11, we get 7. If we took the original values, 255 and 361, multiply them, and then reduce modulo 11, we get a 7. The same thing will happen, modulo 13 and modulo 17. What that means is, for addition and multiplication, we can represent 255 and 361 by their remainders, modulo 11, 13, and 17. But more than that, once we have the remainders, we can do arithmetic on the remainders rather than arithmetic on the original numbers and then reduce to the remainders. Now what does all this have to do with computer arithmetic and with large integers? Well, suppose we wanted to program a computer to work with integer arithmetic and say to work with integers of a size up to about, say, 10 to 100. Well, unfortunately, most modern computers are limited to working with integers of, say, 18 to 20 decimal digits directly. Of course, we could write programs to carry out the analogs of our usual hand computational methods for very large integers, but this would be done in software. Uh, that would mean, then, that the program would run orders of magnitude slower than the most efficient strategies. So how, then, should the programming be done? Well, let's take a look at a realistic example now. Suppose that a computer with 64-bit processor could represent positive integers of a size up to around 2 to the 61 minus 1. That number is about 2.3 times 10 to the 13th. Now, notice if we're trying to work with integers up to the size of around 10 to the 100, we can't do this directly in hardware. How could we efficiently do the arithmetic then on 100-digit integers? 
Well, what we can do is to start representing our integers as remainders on division by multiple moduli, just as we did in the previous section of this lecture. Now, there are advantages to choosing the moduli to be of the form 2 to the k minus 1. In this case, that would mean we'd use moduli of 2 to the 61 minus 1, 2 to the 60 minus 1, etc., until we had enough of those to be able to represent integers of sufficient size. Well, how many of these would we need? Well, we want to be able to represent integers of a size up to about 10 to the 100th power. So we'd solve this equation, 10 to the 100 equals 2 to the k first. k in this case turns out to be about 332.2. So we need exponents of 2 that sum to something more than about 333. Well, if we look at our exponents of 61, 60, 59, etc., we find out that we need to sum six of these, and in that case, we get the sum 351. Therefore, we'll be able to represent our values as remainders modulo 261 minus 1, 260 minus 1, down to 256 minus 1. And then addition, multiplication, and subtraction can be formed directly by computing on those remainders rather than converting back to the long digit form of the integers. In this way, a computer capable of directly manipulating binary integers of length no more than 61 bits, those are binary digits, can compute with integers up to about 100 decimal digits by storing six remainders. This completes the lecture on section 3.7, Applications of Number Theory, and of Part 4, Large Number Arithmetic. Thanks for watching.